It is May the 14th, 2022, and this is the future of photography. The future of photography. Hello and welcome back. I'm Chris. This is Jeremiah. Good, uh, well, good evening, my time. Good morning. And good morning for me. <laughs> and good <where> whatever <laughs> your day is doing right now. Um, Adrian is on a photo event. He's busy. So he'll report us. back next week with all kinds I'm, of good gear for us to uh, aspire to buy, maybe. New, new toys. Um, yeah, we are going to talk about our favorite topic. Whenever the two of us are, are uh, doing our... Our solo show, we are, we, 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 we nerd inevitably, out. We, we, we nerd, nerd out. out. We, we, yeah. we dive into some weird new thing. Um, and, and in this case, it has to do with film making and film translation. So let me preface this with, I'm German and Germans are notoriously lazy when it comes to Movies that are not in the German language. You know, if you go to Sweden or the, or the Netherlands, you see an, an, a Hollywood movie in English with subtitles. That's the way it goes. So Germans are different. Germans need their dub. And uh, as a, you know what, oh, and we're the opposite, even though we tend to see most of our language in film as English, but all of our foreign films uh, are not dubbed. They are subtitled. Um, they are subtitled. Yeah, and and I have I grew up with that, so I've I've seen and they change the titles even. So if you want to talk to someone uh, from the states about a movie, you've you've got to think, okay, what was the t original title of that? Because the one I grew up with was different. And then maybe around the age of seventeen, I began discovering like we, we have we have individual small cinemas that have like on a Wednesday night they would show an original movie not dubbed in wow. English <laughs> or in French or whatever and those those were the times when I then ended up in the cinema and helped me learn English and and all the things that come with it you're doing and, okay you're doing okay uh, thank you and I and I grew really wary of dubs because a dub means it is a different lang a different voice for that actor. It's got to be someone here in Germany. And by the way, it's a very small pool of actors that do dubbing. So um, you, you tend to hear the same voices for different actors. Um, it is, of course, translated and in a, in a way that, they, that it stays in lip sync. So the translations are very often, let's say, a bit clunky. Definitely not. The way I would say things all the time, so um, the, so so it it combines a different voice, including of course a bit of a different performance. Um, a bit. And I, 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 I have to say, as a film, it can be horrible. It can be horrible. I I have one word for this process: criminal. That, that, that's this is it, it. It is a stake in the heart of an actor's performance. It is. I'm. And, I'm with you. I, I, I was trying to be. I was trying to be uh, <laughs> kind of uh, measured no. about this, but I think you're right. I think you're right. It should be bludgeoned be to death and never seen again. The the you know as someone who's just coincidentally recently been mixing uh, my show, my new show, mm -hmm. um, and and so the quality of voice often is is so rooted in the performance, the the nuance yes. of the actor. Um, even, I mean, often when I do um, mixing or finishing, well, I'll, I'll watch the, the film without sound, just for the rhythm of the cut. Then I will, wa I will listen to the film without watching, just for the rhythm and the nuance of performance and story. Then I'll kind of watch it together um, to, you know, before the final stamp is put on. Um, a dubbed version sounds like um, I would only relate to it as a film done by Woody Allen, his first film, which was called What's Up, Tiger Lily, wherein he took a, I think, a public domain uh, Hong Kong film and completely dubbed it oh, <laughs> for different okay. actors. And it's hilarious. I mean, it, it, you know, it has nothing to do with anything in the 
of the movie. And, and also, curiously, my nine-year-old granddaughter showed me a YouTube channel, which is called, oh God, something like uh, dub versions of... Oh, know, okay. Of, of existing films, where they they would take huge sequences of like High School Musical and completely dub this with different yeah. actors. That's comedy. Now, for, inter interestingly enough, when you grow up with that stuff, then you kind of get used to the voice. Like like Robert De Niro has his voice in German, and it's the same. Now, of course, you you also run into areas that. Um, you, you kind of disconnect the voice from the face, as in, I just found out a couple of years ago that in Germany, the, the dub version of Kermit the Frog and uh, Brad Pitt are the same voice, the same <laughs> actor. They're not the same voice, the same voice actor, um, which when so you know it... So either Brad Pitt dubs Kermit or Kermit dubs Brad Pitt. <laughs> yeah, and the guy, of course, looks nothing like... Brad Pitt or Kermit the Frog. So That's dubs, okay, we agree dubs are um, shouldn't a be crime. here. But but they are here and they're around and um and you will of course you will run into problems when you when you show a, a film with subtitles, because then it's hard to concentrate on the action on screen because you keep reading and your eyes are always down there where the Where the, where the text is. So it, it creates problems. So I um, just a few days ago, I, I came across a YouTube video by the Cordo crew. These guys are uh, based in Los Angeles. They are a team of visual effects artists and they do a lot of stuff on YouTube. And they have one, um, one, um, one show called, they call VFX Artists React to bad and great CGI. And they look at CGI from different movies. And uh, one thing they just brought up was a new method for dubbing uh, movies into another language. And, um, well, let's let's just look at the sequence. I'm, I'm just going to play that sequence for you. And <clears throat> it's about half a minute long. And then we'll on our jump in. One of the craziest things I've seen was posted. You make a film in one language and you want to put it into another language. How do you do that? Well, generally you dub it, you add subtitles, you do all that stuff. Hmm. However, obviously, as we know right now, there's a lot of fun AI stuff when it comes to redoing lip movements, facial expressions, all that stuff. This movie called The Champion is basically the first movie to use AI to visually redub the entire film into a new language. Dukan Stales, High Commandant. So size. You can do anything, Commandant. So be it. Wow. Do that lip, man. That All right. So what they are doing, if you're listening to this, this is where you should probably watch or, or follow the link in the show notes to this video. What they're doing with the champion, with that movie, is they have an AI-based technology where they will have the actor speak in front of the camera or speak in front of cameras in a the different language. So they have to find someone who's similar or the actual actor. And then that AI system takes that performance. I'm pretty sure there's more to that than just a piece of software that you press a button on. There's probably some more work in between. But what they do is they change the actual movie and not just the lip motion, but... The, the entire facial expression changes. That gets pretty much... Um, yeah, it, what it, they do is it, it's, it's kind of like doing mocap, but very micro mocap. Mo In other words, the mocap is so directed to the entire face, specifically probably weighted on the lips, and processed so that the, the kind of um, processing really uh, can integrate the movement because the actor who's who is providing the dub and in this way probably you need to step it up in terms of what actors can do the dub sure. because they will actually have to act in front of the camera to provide expressiveness which is then applied to the actual uh, actor that they are dubbing and subtly change their vocal lip movement and their facial expression and uh they they and the, the 
Corridor Crew guys talk about there has been a system around for a while called, um, I think, Audio to Lip, which is a, a, an AI that listens to the audio and tries to find out what the according motion of the mouth would be and then uh, changes that. But it, th the examples you see of that are um, clunky. They don't feel right. There's something weird. In this case, what these guys are doing now with the champion is they are uh, doing this. Well, the examples that I've seen here are they are perfect. So you yeah. see that actor speaking you German. Like you, cannot you, cannot you cannot tell. You cannot tell. It doesn't look artificial at all. And it ends up being several different kind of movies because, of course, there will be nuances in the in the performance and um, the language. Of course, changes something too. But isn't that Isn't that wild? What how what what does that do with you, Jeremiah, as a oh my. as a producer? Well, there's there's a, a couple of things. Uh, you know, when it comes to um, scripted film, television, etc., I think it offers a a um, a door, more of an access to see better movies, better dubs, if you will, mm. better translations. Uh, of films um, that are less distracting. Because one thing about bad dubs, and we've all seen it, um, I mean, Sergio Leone made all of his movies uh, silent and, and redubbed <laughs> the entire show, uh, often would have big music playing on set to generate the a kind of rhythm and focus for the actor. I mean, uh, so we all see the kind of what we call lip flap, um, which is the desynchronized of, of lip movements and, and whatnot, which is distracting from the performance. So as we try to move a dub performance into a real performance, um, I think this is an advantage. It's good. It also provides us with um, new tools uh, to be able to shape even existing performance. So for example, if I am doing what we call looping, uh, post-production uh, ADR. So automatic, ADR, automatic uh, dialogue um, replacement. Dialogue right. replacement. Yeah. Uh, where I want to add um, a nuance, change a word, uh, which, I, which we often do, uh, add or change a word. Um, with the real actor, we can do it. It'll be seamlessly. We can do that in post-production. So Sometimes you have to do it because because you were sh sh doing an outdoor shoot and there was an airplane overhead or something like that. Sometimes you yeah, have to. Uh, Replace sure. the dialogue because uh, or, of these or, things, or, right? Or often just change uh, a off-camera reaction from him to her or right. they to him or, right. um, you know, a truck to car just because of what's going on in the scene and, and uh, or, or even add some kind of uh, expression. What that does in post for, for post, uh, post uh, audio recording is provide a very seamless way of doing it. Because now right. we all often have to kind of uh, disguise or, or cut the additional dialogue into the reverse cut so you don't see the lips of the actors moving and all That's of that. That's a trick we they do in dubs as well, because they let the other yeah. actor speak from the off and then they, uh, yeah. they, they the camera comes in, yeah. Now we're used to it. We do this all the time. It's no big deal. Um, but with this kind of technology, Everything's on the table because you can, you can literally let the scene play a little longer, for example, go back to the original cut mark, add a little bit of footage, <laughs> and add dialogue to the film itself, which will, I think... Uh, be another seamless way of, of getting control over that. Now, I say this. Uh, in terms of the technology, and Chris and you and I are like, yeah, this is amazing. Wow, all the great things that could happen. Yes, but what yes and could no. Okay. possibly <laughs> go wrong with such a technology in politics, documentary, filmmaking? Uh, you know, The dystopian with, angle is not far from with, when these things It is come, biting yeah. at our heels when, when, when we think of, uh, of, quote, a leaked video where you apply, say, a racist comment to an actor. And now with, with uh, AI, you can actually use their own voice, their own words. You can synthesize their own voice, yes. You can. 
Uh, you could even create a digital version of them very close to how they look and put whatever they whatever you want in their in their mouth and this could create tremendous upheaval in in what we consider truthfulness in film and uh, i mean we're close to that anyway but i mean uh, we we're doing things today or or let's say hollywood does things today like face replacement like you uh when in in the olden days if you had a stuntman you you'd have that uh you'd have to disguise them really well to make sure yeah. that it doesn't look like uh, that's not the actual actor nowadays you can just replace their face in post sure. and uh you you wouldn't be any wiser so they, they, those yeah. techn those techniques have been around for a while and they yeah, have been, they have been expensive while. to do that relatively expensive It'll be much now, cheaper. Now uh, you could probably do it on a desktop and oh, uh, on your phone probably, sooner or later. On your uh, yeah, phone. I was going to yeah. say that next year yeah. on your phone you can do all of this. So in in kind of creating a um, a warning sign, um, I think there's probably going to be a interesting industry that starts to come out of processing all film to determine if it is manipulated or not. I, I can see this as a seal of approval. In, in other words, if you're watching something with a stamp that this is actual or this has been manipulated. Now, we do have something like that for photography when we talk about, like there are modules that you can buy for your big cameras, for your SLRs, DSLRs, for your big mirrorless cameras that add a, a, a cryptographic signature to some some photos. Those would be used on crime scenes and so on. That, uh, authentication. It's an authentication thing, even though these things have mostly been cracked <laughs> so yet. But but still, I mean, there's, a, there's an effort to, to provide that. Um, there might be some form of hidden watermarks that will allow you to verify that this is a genuine uh, production. But then still, if you look at how movies are made, you have, you shoot the movie, you do color correction, you do grading, you do, you, you replace backgrounds, you extend backgrounds, you, you have, you have your, your virtual parts of scenes because you need a bigger lake and stuff like that. So the, the how what percentage of what you do okay you you're working on a show right now what percentage of that show is is modified in one way or another i'd say 100% well, uh, to a certain extent you're you're right i mean yesterday afternoon uh, you know i did color grading on an episode uh the episode is say 42 minutes mm -hmm. Um, you know, it was three and a half hours of color grading. Every single scene uh, is color graded. Every single scene is color yeah. graded and some, you know, where I would just lift the highlights in the eye, just add a little sure. bit of, of a third of a stop, half a stop, very subtle stuff that you can't see separating from the background, replacing the sky from say overcast to cloudy and dark. Um, all of those things, even, you know, there was one actor who, uh, needed to be played by a young boy, um, you know, for a flashback. Just replace the eye color to match. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so, I mean, all of these things we do. And, and so y you work with it very accurately and, and distinctly. And, of course, the technologies now of doing secondary color and pr primary color adjustments are so absolutely amazing. I mean, um, now we can work... Once it's set up properly, it can work virtually, um, where I'm seeing it as long as I'm looking at it in a similarly darkened room and the color space is set perfectly. It's, I'm seeing what the tech is seeing. I don't even have to go to the stage. Hmm. And so those things are very, very possible. And we do this constantly like Photoshop. You take a picture, very few people will post a raw picture. Correct. Of I course mean, not. A raw no, you don't do so, that. <laughs> no. Uh, or print the negative. I mean, that's the real picture. So it has to be processed in some way, always has been. It, whether it's just a reversal from the negative to the positive or applying a set of visual circumstances, which could be 
even one selection of a film stock is making a decision on aesthetics. It's very different of course. shooting in Portra, you know, Kodak or an Ilford black and white. That, that's, that's an aesthetic choice. Uh, in digital, of course, this thing, every camera has a different chip, which reads a skin tone differently. So it's every step of the way, reality is left. <laughs> and so, in, in some cases, you have to work really hard to make multiple cameras play together nicely. Certainly so. Yeah. Um, you know, I, so do I, you know, in working with this kind of technology, which I, of course, embrace wholeheartedly because it gives me more tools for creativity, but my dystopian side, which I think is very familiar to anybody that, who's been listening to me, this is quite frightening because... Is that dystopian? Okay, okay, you have the training to maybe spot these things or to be skeptical because you know what's possible. Me, me, me too. I see something. If I saw, I don't know, if I saw Putin, um, I don't know, do something that I would never see him do, I would... Not go, oh, no, I have to share this with the world. I go, hmm, is this real? Could this the be problem, faked? The hmm? problem. And this is, I forget the exact quote where they say that um, truth moves slowly and lies are spread like wildfire. So especially in social media nowadays, a kind of clickbait, you know, uh, um, video that ascribes, say, a racist comment to somebody who is not racist goes mm. out like wildfire and is all over social media before the person actually says, no, I never said that. I was never there. I, this is not me. So that's And then most really people the would problem. not believe them. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So that is really <laughs> the problem always um, is, is that we have come face to face with some of our most exciting technology as humans, which is, say, the internet on Earth, the web telescope in space. We love, still love that. Um, but th the technology of the internet, which all of us have grown up with and embraced and remember things before it happened and now, um, has been one of the most, um, I guess, the fuel that has uh, eroded uh, the democratic focus of our world over the last 20 years. That's, that's my opinion, uh, but that's how I see it. And I am, not, any, I am a very, very non-Luddite person, as you know, Chris. You know, I love all technology. I love technology as technology, as art, as creative process, as tools, something that I'm attracted to uh, as some gain traction, some fall by the wayside. But... I also recognize the darker side of it. And each of our tools in the world, uh, from the caves on up, whether it's a, a hammer, you know, to, to build something is also a, an axe to hurt someone. Um, you know, a wheel which helps us move wood is also something that, that moves us further from our home and, and increases conflict. And you, you can basically track technology on both sides always so maybe that's my rant. That's my well rant. You have, you're perfectly justified to to rant about that uh maybe we need something like regulation for these kind of things maybe regulation is necessary. fine as long as that regulation can be applied oh yes uh, with oh, yes. justice so there is regulation we have lots of regulation in the stock market but stock market manipulation happens every day um, and there's a reason why the Dali folks, which, which we've talked about um, several mm -hmm. times here on the show, um, why they still haven't made it public yet. It's still in beta, and it, I, I predict it will stay in beta for a while because there are lots of potential issues with that. Anyway, I think um, we have good reasons to be excited and frightened of what's Can to come here. Can you think of different ways to apply uh, the this dubbing technology outside a film um certainly oh, in advertising but but um i mean what what we could do is we could have uh, something like gpt3 write an episode of the future of photography and then we could have our virtual selves um on the screen say it 
by being animated. You're getting an <laughs> alert there. Uh, disregard evacuation notice. Training exercise only. <laughs> oh, it was a training exercise. It's California. You know, all hell is breaking loose. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> well, at, at least they didn't announce the next nuclear the war. World. So Not yet. There we go. Um, anyway, let's leave it. Let's leave it at that. I think there's plenty of food for thought for anyone who's listening or watching. Sure. Um, um, for we our encourage picks. everyone to really check this out. With yeah, Valley. go go. It, it is the amazing. link is in the show notes. Mm. Have watch it. Uh, at starts at about ten minutes into the video. Um, give it a give it a watch. It's about a minute, two minutes long. It's worth getting your mind blown. Um, the picks of the week. You have brought us something that goes along with what we talked about here. The yes, political history of dubbing in films. Yes, this is a, a, a very uh, thought-provoking article. And, and it, it really, you know, it, it touches on some of the things that, that Chris... Um, had indicated nationalist voices, interesting. Mm -hmm. So there is that sense of nationalism, of pride in language. Uh, and certainly while American films were, were kind of the machine after, after the war um, that was driving um, kind of international audiences, um, and yet people love to see movies in their own language it's comforting it's fun and uh, and it gives them a little bit of connection to the characters uh but um i if you're at all interested in in dubbing technology and how it works this is a more philosophical approach and political approach in terms of understanding where this comes from and where it's going all right and yeah. I brought I brought something that is in the realm of the AI, but in a different way, and it has to do with movies. So, um, okay, that that will take about five minutes, but I think it's worth it. So um, sure. here's an ep episode of Two Minute Papers, um, looking at at new scientific papers, and uh, the host looks at uh, an AI by DeepMind called Mu, Mu Zero. Mu Zero is a, an AI that learns to play games like, I don't know, StarCraft, for example. And it learns it by playing against itself. And it does it in a really good way. Uh, it usually tends to beat people. Um, it, 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 it gets better and better after several days, after just a few days, like three, three weeks of training. It's better than, the, than humans and these kind of things. Um, there are other AIs out there, like um, AlphaGo, for example, that uh, beats the best Go player. Um, of course, years ago, there was uh, chess computers. And this is a more universal one. And it's so universal that what they did is they um, applied it to video compression. So they they declared... Um, the, the parameters in the VP9 video compression, which is a, a in your browser and YouTube uses it and so on. It's a very good video compression, um, and it uh, it it uh, it treated the parameters to apply to different frames in that compression as a game, and it played, oh. and it improved VP9, and uh, oh. not just a little bit. It improved VP9, uh, VP9's compression by almost five percent. And if you if you know what's behind this video compression, there is really good people who worked on this for tens of years, for decades, and uh, and uh, they they let a, a gaming focused AI crunch video, and it ended up improving VP9 by a five percent. So same quality, five percent smaller. Doesn't sound like much. It's huge when you know what's what goes into video compression. As for so, me, I, I, I'll never let an opportunity for a dystopian thought <laughs> slip by. But um, not surprised. You know, I, as as um, blockchain gaming tries to gain some traction, um, you know, Axie Infinity notwithstanding, they've mm -hmm. dropped because they're fickle. They, these things are very faddish. They come up, they go down, there's new games. And, you know, gamers are like, we love it for a year, then we there's a new game. So, uh, but I can see the the play, 
play for pay uh, model of gaming, which is growing. Um, and the possibilities of basically using an AI to play for pay oh yeah uh, is yeah is something that is pretty um if, I, mean, I can't believe anybody hasn't thought of it <laughs> oh if if there's ways to cheat in gaming there will they will be uh, found out and they will be employed that's for sure sure But anyway like playing, playing poker against a computer that you think is of course of yeah, course true Anyway, with right. that, plenty of food for thought. We, um, oops, wrong button. I think we, yeah, we, uh, the, the, and the, the more we talk <laughs> we about this, the more death. dystopian it gets. Let's just stop it here. <laughs> uh, Good, it's fun, okay. but it's, it's still amazing having grown up in a, in a world of bad dubs, um, I, I can I can see I can see a market emerge of old films sure. being redubbed same way oh, yeah. some old films are being re uh, 3Dified. Um, that is going to happen with dubs and new I dubs see, and stuff. I see taking um, films that are not under copyright and completely yeah. rewriting them. A la, that will happen. Uh, anyway, we're back soon with more. Um, you can of course find us online. Until then, anyway, take care and bye bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Thank you.